We'll begin. I'm the uh, substitute chairman today, and I want to put it up front. I am not getting out of title pay. So uh, let's begin with a safety briefing, please. Your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen and adhere to the following instructions. If you witness an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and call 911 immediately. Please follow any audible instructions provided through the public address system or visually on screens in the event of an emergency. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell B down the hallway past the elevators. If you have a mobility disability or cannot self-evacuate, please proceed down stairwell D or E if instructed to go to another floor or evacuate the building. MTA staff or emergency personnel will assist you from there. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. If you need assistance during an evacuation, please tell an MTA staff member or emergency personnel. Thank you and have a safe day. Okay, we'll begin with the public comments. Is there anyone here to speak today? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we have 11 members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness, we will limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. We have seven in-person speakers and four remote speakers today. We will alternate two in-person and then two remote speakers. The first speaker will be Bruce Hain, followed by Jack Nirenberg. Um, good morning. This is the first time I've spoken in front of the Long Island Railroad, uh, Long Island Metro North uh, Railroad uh, committee, and um, I'm hoping to double my minutes because I, <laughs> uh, the comment is directed to the um, uh, uh, capital projects uh, committee as well. Um, it's d even with four minutes, it's it's so impossible for me to write it down and then try and spiel it off, or um, just try and spiel without knowing what I'm going to say because. There are too many details, and to make it clear, you could find more clear uh, communication of what I'm trying to say on my website, which is called Bruce Hain. So I'll use this as an opportunity to give my name, as well as not my website, the YouTube channel, Bruce Hain, B R U C E E H A I N. So we've gotten that far, and. Um, now, what was the next thing? Um, let's get one thing straight. Jamaica Station, all the platforms at Jamaica Station are 1,000 feet long. All the pre-existing platforms are 1,000 feet long. Now, nobody's going to contradict me on that, although people have. People at the station all think you can't stop a 12-car train at one of those platforms and have all the doors opposite the platform, but you can. All the people at the station seem to think that, and somebody, it seems to me, is propagandizing them to think it. But uh, the operators know better. And the reason you can't stay, you, you, you've had 12 car trains for 50 years with 85 foot cars, but you don't have any signal, the signals are in the middle of, of the platform. They're, sometimes they're near the end of the platform, but they're not out front where they need to be to stop 12-car trains. Now, with the current track configuration, you could expand platform A and platform B, both to take 14-car trains if you want. So what is the big deal? And you wouldn't do that with uh, expanding the canopy. Just expand the platform if you need 14-car four uh, trains, but I don't think you do. 
I think you need not to change the configuration of those platforms. And as far as uh, the bridge, you know, there's no elevators in there, and I don't know if that's close as practically possible or not, practicably possible. But anyway, you're introducing these ladder tracks to get from Elmont to, um, to the main line. You are introducing directional conflicts on the main line of the Long Island Railroad. Now, I hope you people can understand. You don't want to introduce directional conflicts there. You should be working to get rid of directional conflicts. That's Queens interlocking. It should have been grade separated. It could have been grade separated with the Belmont Terminal grade separated as well. And not for a lot of money. It's easy to do that kind of stuff now. There is enough uh, linear feet there to do that, except the Elmont uh, uh, station, the platform there, where you jacked up the bridge and shored it up and moved the bridge over so that you could have a st five stations in the space of a mile. That platform blocks it, so it's very difficult to get it grade separated going west. So that's too bad. And the one that's already built, Oh, I guess we're finished. I never get to that one. I'm always about to talk about it. The next speaker is Jack Nirenberg, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Good morning, everyone. I am Jack Nirenberg, and I'm the Vice President of Passengers United. So if you recall, a, uh, a few months back, I was uh, explain that there's a need for uh, better passenger information displays, more particularly on the uh, M7 and M9 fleets where we have those uh, digital screens that are currently just showing advertising. And I mentioned that I have uh, renderings of what those uh, information displays could look like, so here they are. If, if, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but this is for the record. So as you can see, this would show a uh, much more comprehensive overview of uh, the train route, uh, ETAs as well, not just uh, the next stop, but upcoming stops as well, giving a much more, uh, a much better overview of uh, the uh, overall trip, as well as which cars would platform at those stations as well. And it would not just be uh, one single color. I think I, there was a misprint, but if you look at the uh, Babylon line, for example, it would show like this. Again, very readable. And uh, not only would you be uh, seeing those, but at major stations like Jamaica, for example, where uh, you have multiple tracks, many connections, and especially with the uh, new east side access timetables, which speaking of which, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the uh, Grand Central Direct program before the new timetables go out. But at these major stations, where if the schedules have not changed since the uh, draft, there would be no more timed connections at Jamaica. So this would show not just what the uh, upcoming connections are, but what tracks those would be on for uh, better mobility and uh, better information. I'm gonna be speaking to the second committee as well. And uh, also, let's say a train is delayed by uh, whatever number of minutes. That would be reflected as well, and the ETA would be updating in real time. So this is, uh, I mentioned, this is based off of uh, existing systems that I've seen in uh, the Netherlands, in Belgium, and uh, just all over. And I think it's especially overdue for, uh, for the Long Island Railroad, which is the busiest, if I'm not mistaken, the busiest commuter rail network in the U.S. and uh, I think possibly, possibly the world. And we have the screens already, but what this would be, I'm proposing, would be a uh, separate uh, information uh, system that would either work, uh, that would either be connected to the existing uh, ASI system, I'm not sure what exactly the manufacturer is for the M9s, but I'm not sure if It'll, it could possibly work in some way. I know it works in, uh, in Europe, 
but it would be uh, either working with the existing systems or independently from them. But I know it is possible. We have the screens already, so all we have to do is just put together a uh, system that'll uh, provide this information that is so essential to everyday commuters. And that's it for me. Happy holidays, and thank you very much. The next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by the Savior of Jamaica. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to speak about Metro North, and then I'll transfer the other two minutes to talk about LIRR. Um, so with Metro North, the complaints that we're getting with Metro North is that they need more express service uh, from New Haven into Grand Central. And these express trains should be better timed with Shoreline East trains. Uh, that is a complaint that I'm getting. And I'm hoping that you guys will look at that schedule because uh, Shoreline East, you know, with the new M8s being placed there, the service is beginning to pick up. Um, so you definitely need to have that flexibility, um, especially have more late trains. Um, and now with Grand Central Madison opening, you know, there, there's going to be people wanting to switch to the LIRR. And the other uh, thing that I want to bring up is city ticket. Um, there needs to be a universal city ticket between the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. So now with, you know, LIRR and Metro North merging um, into Grand Central, you have that there. It would be great to have a ticket where you could ride from Fordham all the way to Jamaica. Um, so that's something that the railroad needs to look at. And also one of the things that people were asking was uh, they want to know in the schedules if there's a way that they could put in the walking times from the uh, Metro North concourse to the LIRR platforms um, so that people could better plan their schedules. I don't know if you guys can put that into the apps somehow, but that would be uh, helpful. Um, and the other request that we're also getting is you need, you know, better cross honoring because uh, I know the D train's been out um, in the Bronx and people wanted cross honoring for Metro North. So that's a, a big issue. Um, so now I'm going to get into my LIRR time if I can. Um, so with the Long Island Railroad, uh, we just heard a big announcement on Twitter that you guys are thinking about running shuttle trains. Um, we're excited about that. Um, we would have wished it would have been open, but sometimes you want to take your time and get it done right. Um, so we understand why the railroad has to work out, you know, all the uh, systems in Grand Central. But one thing I would hope is that there's more service or at least adequate service for people in Queens um, and even, uh, you know, Brooklyn. Because when you guys make, you know, when you guys open up Grand Central, you'll need to give time to people so they can plan the schedules. Because remember, the shuttle trains are still running to Atlantic under your plan. Um, so you guys should release the schedules now because uh, you guys should have the schedules ready so that we can understand what's coming when Grand Central opens up. Um, and also, I think that that should also be on the apps. One thing people were telling me, it would be nice on the mobile app to have a $3.75 ticket, a $3.75 ticket, to either Grand Central or Penn Station on the mobile app, but you know, $5 on the vending machine, obviously, because it's hard to make change. So that is a good, great suggestion. Um, but I think communication for Grand Central, it needs to start two or three weeks before the opening. And so like this, people can, you know, plan their schedules, make adjustments, and also the ticket machines. You guys have to get that ready. Um, and I was going to throw in something, maybe the first day of Grand Central Madison, y'all can make it free so that everyone can enjoy it and come on in and check it out. And maybe y'all should even have a community day where people can come and tour the station uh, like y'all did with the Second Avenue subway. Um, I want to wish all of you a very uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And thank you, everyone. The next speaker is the savior of Jamaica, followed by Jason Anthony. Hey, good uh, well, good morning. I mean, I'd like to say good evening. We're live here from the beautiful city of Doha, Qatar. 
after the World Cup final, you know, Charlton people are at. But yeah, good afternoon. Um, I want to um, make the announcement that I'm very proud that Grand Central Madison will be opening for shuttle service. Like the previous speaker said, uh, you, you should guys should release the schedule, you know, a couple of weeks in advance so, so people can plan out, you know. And yeah, we do need to increase uh, like a unified city ticket. Like, for example, if I could go from, let's say, Hollis to, let's say, Yankee Stadium on the Metro North. Now, that would really help really well. And, it, and also will save time for people, you know, making those. Sometimes it could be tight connections between LA double R trains and Metro North trains. So I'm very looking forward to for service to Grand Central Madison. And, and, and you guys need to fix up Hollis Station because that station is absolute abysmal. <laughs> It's, it, that this is just an absolute joy. Every time I go there, I just feel so embarrassed, so sad on the way. Wooden platform? What is it? The 1800s? Nah, no, nah, that's completely unacceptable in the 21st century with the MT um, having bail money of billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's completely unacceptable, man. Oh, you should guys uh, uh, look into retrofitting the, the M7s and M9. And C3 cards with the seats. Uh, they're like leather seats that I saw on the Qatar subway. Those those seats look beautiful. But yeah, let's get to the situation with John Minch. No, finally. Guy taking the pictures inside the Jamaica LA Double R station and the air train section. That's illegal. And this that's prohibited. So you guys should take a look into that and, and, and try to get rid of them because you guys keep going to the parking lot. So that's all I gotta say. Happy Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's. Vamos Argentina, three-time champion, and have a safe Christmas and New Year's, guys. So take care. The next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Christopher Greif. Good morning. Jason Anthony here. Yet again. People like the previous speaker shouldn't be allowed to speak in this in any MTA board meetings because cyber bullies shouldn't be allowed because when public figures like myself that ten Meetings like this are exposed to cyber bullies. But let's get to the issues. First, to Long Island Railroad. Last night, I was at Penn Station, like always. Around midnight, Amtrak, with their shenanigans, they closed the access to the bathrooms. Since October, they have been doing this. And now, they literally, they are denying access to the restrooms for those that rely on the LIRR. I have sent to Hector Garcia images of this. Kathy, what are you going to do about this? Since that the restrooms in Penn Station are closed. Because I have asked Amtrak police about this. I will get an answer from them. And at the same time, last night I was at Grand Central too. Let's go to Metro North. Because at the same time, I was at Grand Central. I'm very excited to see East Side Access open. But I still see homeless people wandering around in both stations, at Penn Station and at Grand Central. But no homeless outreach personnel from BRC. It's totally disgraceful as a native New Yorker born in the Southview section of the Bronx. See 
no BRC or no city personnel in both commuter hubs. Why? Do I need to call the NYPD commissioner to resign again like I did with the previous NYPD commissioner? Do I need to do that again? I might have to do it in Christmas. Because as a New Yorker that uses mass transit since I was a kid, and I don't need a tu tourist that visits the Big Apple seeing our biggest transit hubs, Penn Station and Grand Central, totally disgusted by seeing people want lowering our two transit hubs. Kathy, let's see if we can start 2023 with the right foot, not with the left foot. I'll see you guys in transit. The next speaker is Christopher Greif, followed by Andy Pollack. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. I'm Christopher D. Greif. Happy holidays to everyone. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, bring up is um, on a good note. First of all, I do want to thank Long Island Railroad with fantastic work we've seen with Long Island Cares at stations and glad to see them at certain other parts of Penn Station. That one thing I do want to say that it's great to see them there. MTA uh, Chief, I want to thank you also because during the holidays yesterday, the holiday train had some of your officers there and a lot of little kids were having fun. So I do want to thank you on behalf of your all your officers and the ones who are downstairs and the security guards who are in this building. Thank you for always protecting us in this building and always give us the courtesy and respect in the building. So I don't want to thank every law enforcement here. And we also need to always remember, work together with the community and let's solve these problems. Some of these problems, as the person before me, we need to also make sure that our officials are up to speed and making sure that we're getting, they're getting necessary help. And we know that help needs to be helped on Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and on the subways. And that's something we have to always bow our elector officials. The law enforcement do the best they can, but their hands are tied and it's not easy for them. Trust me, I, I'm an advocate for people with disabilities. It is not easy sometimes. It's called a challenge. I'm also very hope that next year in the 2023 budgets and for the railroads that we see more accessibility special buttons. As you know, Long Island Cares is only at the certain terminals. But in all other stations, you may have it on the Long Island Railroad, those special accessibility buttons that alerts the customers that there is an accessible customer. That could be a senior or a person with a disability. I hope to see that on the Metro North. Hope to see more in the railroad in the Suffolk County turf at the same time, as well as the Metro North end, because the more that customers who want to go on the train and may want to come down to the, the Manhattan or go up north or east to those islands, they will help them very much to continue. Please to conclude have your remarks. Oh, I'm, I thought I was doing both railroads. Okay, continue. Okay. Um, the bottom line, what I want to say is, is the accessibility community with representing both ADA task force is extremely important to make sure that conductors see a walker or a wheelchair or any mobile devices on these stations. It is extremely important that next year we can hopefully increase it very much so people can go to Grand Central Madison and connect to a Metro North or Long Island Railroad to explore different things in New York. More tourist attraction will give a great way. But I understand that we still have to make sure we do the combo. So I am supporting the PCAC's combo for both tickets for the Metro North and Long Island Railroad because this will give accessibility an optional to help them to get where they want to go. Because as you see, yeah, it's maybe winter and the holiday season is just soon coming at the end. 
but spring and summer, people want to get a chance to go out. Everyone, I want to wish everyone a happy, healthy holiday, and please be safe. Thank you. The next speaker is Andy Pollack, followed by Sally Wolf. Okay. Hello there, everyone. My name is Andy Pollack, and I am a member of Passengers United. So I'm going to make one brief Metro North point for this month. I'm glad that news came out that Metro North is going to be adding new stations in the East Bronx, which will include Hunts Point, Park Chester Van Nest, Morris Park, and of course, the transit desert known as Co-op City. For these Bronx residents, it's going to save a lot of time on their commute. Sure, it's a good start, but let's hope we can be on time with this 2027 estimated completion date. Okay, now we're going to go to Long Island Railroad. My main talking point today, we have to keep the freedom ticket. Because many of you know, I lived in the transit desert known as Fresh Meadows in Queens. And our closest Long Island Railroad station is in Auburndale. We desperately need to keep city ticket. And especially because when Grand Central opens, we will have half hourly service to points east along the Port Washington branch. And lastly, I want to discuss Grand Central Madison. So there is some good and there is some bad. As to be expected, it looks like Grand Central will not be opening until sometime in 2023. That was expected. But for a start, at least operating these shuttle trains between Jamaica and Grand Central will be a good lead way into the full opening. And I'm glad that the MTA is going to be transparent with us and give us at least a three week opening notice date of when the new station will open. So I'm going to conclude my remarks. Thank you all very much. Have a happy Halloween holiday season. And I will be speaking at New York City Transit later on. The next speaker is Sally Wolf, followed by Liam Blank. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sally Wolf. I live in Flatiron, although I'm actually zooming in for my parents' house in Great Neck, having gotten here on the LIRR. Happy and healthy holidays to you all, and thank you again for this opportunity to speak. It's my fourth time here, my fourth month. When I first came in September, I didn't expect to keep returning. Time is precious, both for you and for me, and yet here we are. I'm back again to voice the same idea to create safe spaces, masked cars or sections of cars for anyone still feeling cautious. To the extent of my knowledge, nothing has been created, no broad attempt to implement or even to pilot the idea in a smaller way, despite the simplicity and the lack of expense it would require. When I ride the trains as I did last night to get to Great Neck, it's to see the people I love most. I am a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a friend, The trains connect me literally to the people I love. They are a passage to the best sources of joy in my life, my parents, my siblings, my nephew, my nieces, my friends. The trains deliver hugs and love and time together. You all deliver that to each of us who rides them. And now you have a chance to help deliver it more safely. Not only safety on the tracks, which is so great, but also safety within the cars. And I'm asking, what will it take to change? Headlines every day about the current triple-demic are up. Just this morning, my Manhattan building sent an email about three new cases just within our building. This idea is practical, simple, inexpensive. Only signage is required. It builds on you do you. It lets people like me ride more safely, eliminating physical anxiety, physical and mental anxiety. And it starts with you. And I really, I welcome the opportunity to talk further, to help you with any rollout. I I just really would appreciate it. And on a good note, I just wanted to compliment. I spent time in Moynihan Hall yesterday before riding out. It was my first time there and it is stunning and such a wonderful addition. Thank you. Happy and healthy holidays to you all. The next speaker is Liam Blank, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Liam Blank. I'm the new associate director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, also known as PCAC. We applaud the Long Island Railroad for making great progress on Grand Central Madison, which will provide riders to and from Long Island with direct access to East Midtown. We're also encouraged by Metro North Railroad's latest advancements on the Penn Station Access Project, which will connect West Westchester County and the Bronx with Penn Station. We hope to also see a new ticket that allows transfers between the railroads as a testament to the inter interconnectivity that these expansion projects will provide. We were also thrilled by the announcement at the new New York panel about expansion of city ticket to cover all commuter rail trips at the same low fare, regardless of time or day, within New York City. Of course, PCAC will continue to advocate for freedom ticket, which would be a weekly ticket option with transfers to buses and subways. On their own, these projects will improve rail accessibility and affordability for a greater share of the region's residents. Together, they represent one giant leap toward the gold standard, an integrated regional rail network that provides easy access for all residents of New York City and its surrounding suburbs. Achieving this goal means continuing to prioritize and invest in the projects that make transit a seamless experience for its riders. More trust from the public can later translate to greater investment from the state. That is achievable with more transparency about project timelines. For example, although Grand Central Madison is now nearing completion, we still don't know exactly when it's set to open to the public. We understand that these projects are complex and require a lot of planning and preparation, but it's important that we know when they will be finished so we can ensure accountability and riders can prepare for the upcoming service changes. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you today. The work that you are doing is essential in improving public transit for millions of people living in our region. And we encourage you to continue your efforts toward making transit safer, faster, cleaner, and more affordable than ever before. Thank you. The next speaker is Jesse Figueroa, followed by Mary Bowden. Yeah. Morning, everybody. I am a disabled, vet uh, disabled veteran. I served in the uh, National Guard during Ground Zero and then went to Iraq in 03. Um, I'm also a voluntary advocate with the MTA because I help people need what they got to go and all that stuff. The only thing I want to bring about is that I was harassed by home, a homeless guy at Atlantic Terminal. That I, and uh, I'd like to address it here to this committee. So I'm just asking if there's the way that this can end so we can get where we got to go, point A to point B, safe and sound. That's all I got, so I'll see you at the Subway and Buses Committee. Thank you. The final speaker is Mary Bowden. <clears throat> Kathy, it's your responsibility to see that your team follows the law as currently written. Can't make up stuff because you think it works better for railroads and not for the rest of the people. And I'm speaking specifically at this point, the Roaring Brook Crossing. For years, you had a red box in there, no matter what I said. You used the red box because you liked it. But the driver was not informed. Please stop the clock. I recognize that you have things to do, and, but it doesn't come out of my time. The don't block the box is a black and white design because people, colorblind people can't see red. It's used in more places today than it has been before because it's significant. It gives people the right to turn left across traffic because an intersection isn't blocked. Roaring Brook requires, for the safety of drivers and everybody else, the white don't block the box design. Railroads are not special. The driver needs to have consistent information. You have a railroad crossing, you have gates, 
Too many times you have flashing red lights, which were designed before traffic lights were invented. You go across the Willis Avenue Bridge, there's gates and traffic lights. You go to Florida, every crossing of a canal has gates and traffic lights. So why doesn't Long Island Railroad at all the crossings where there are gates? Why aren't there lights? Traffic lights with a camera up there to take pictures. Drivers today are distracted and, and aggressive. Safety requires consistency. That was taught to me by a former executive of the New York State Thruway who works in this building. So it's your responsibility to see that your team follows the safest requirements on the books today. Yes, the manual uniform traffic involved. It has many errors in it, but we have to start somewhere because this is a biggie. Now, if you can't have your team use correct lines at Roaring Brook and traffic lights on Long Island, then it's time for you to retire and let somebody else do it. There are a whole series of younger people today who are doing it correctly. Somebody recently told me, thank you for planting trees. I plant trees. The box is a tree. It provides safety for the next generation beyond my grandchildren. That concludes the public speakers for today. Thank you, and thank you to all of our uh, this morning's speakers. I want to move on to the approval of the joint mi meeting minutes from our November 29th. May I have a motion and a second? Motion, second. Any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? If not, um, all in favor to approve? Yes, OK. Meeting minutes approved. Um, there aren't any changes on the work plans. Nope, no changes to either so work plan. So we can go ahead with the agency reports. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, before we actually get into my prepared remarks and the PowerPoint, which was going to be a retrospective on 2022 for both railroads, uh, we're going to look ahead a little bit because there's been some news today on Grand Central Madison, which I want to catch this committee up on uh, if they haven't read Newsday or had the chance to watch the Today Show this morning. Um, but, uh, you know, we're very excited to be a couple weeks out in terms of the inaugural service at GCM. Um, as Jamie Torres Springer reported last month, and Jana's been talking about a little bit for the past few weeks, um, there's some system testing that's still underway, um, which is going. I, that's, it's a C&D project, so they're the ones who are, are, you know, really making sure that the systems are safe for opening day. That work is going on now. And once that work is done, the expectation is within the next couple weeks we will be inaugurating a shuttle service between Grand Central, Madison, and Jamaica, um, which we are calling Grand Central direct. Um, at that time, we will continue to run the full service into Penn that we're running now. Uh, so this is really just a way of getting our customers acclimated to the new space, acclimated to the new service, excited about the new service. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about the new service. Uh, and then the expectation would be um, that we would not do the switch over to the full GCM schedule for a minimum of three weeks, maybe a little bit longer, just to give our customers the opportunity to, to kind of get the lay of the land and plan their travel accordingly. Um, so more on this, obviously. We'll keep everybody up to speed, but that's the current plan. Um, there was a good article in Newsday about it this morning, and uh, you know we continue to work very, very hard to be able to uh, commence the shuttle service within the next couple weeks, uh, and then make the switch over to the full GCM service You know, a minimum of three weeks after that. Um, so before I actually go to the rest of my remarks, maybe I'll just pause for questions if there are any about that from the committee. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So now we get to the looking back portion of our program this morning. As we put a bow on 2022 and prepare for our very special grand opening for GCM, uh, we want to look back in appreciation at the fine accomplishments of both of the railroads for the last 12 months. 
Long Island Railroad is literally a bigger railroad than it was in January of 2022, which feels like a million years ago now, with major expansion initiatives and infrastructure growth rivaling that of any other year in its long and storied existence. However, both railroads had more than their fair share of success stories in 2022, and I'm going to go through some of the highlights. Back in February, both railroads, in an effort to bring COVID-weary customers back to our system, rolled out brand new fare programs featuring wallet-friendly discounts such as 10% off our monthly tickets, 20% off a new 20-trip peak ticket, and a newly expanded city ticket, which was now valid during all off-peak hours, not just weekends. In March, C&D and Metro North wrapped up a six-month renewal project to replace the 110-year-old Wickers Creek culvert in Dobbs Ferry, which was destroyed by Tropical Storm Ida the previous September. As part of that project, they rebuilt the entire four-track right-of-way above it, reinstalling rails, ties, ballast, third rail, and making sure that signals and PTC systems operated flawlessly. The completion of the project meant faster travel times and increased capacity on the Hudson Line, as we had had to imp uh, implement a reduced schedule in order to accommodate the six months of repair work. Also in March, Metro North announced the start of construction on a full slate of improvements to three Harlem Line stations, Hartsdale, Scarsdale, and Purdy's. The upgrades will include street and platform elevators, ADA-compliant sidewalks and curb ramps, new staircases and closed-circuit TV, as well as increased electrical capacity. Hartsdale and Scarsdale are scheduled for substantial completion in the second quarter, Purdy's in quarter three. In April, uh, sorry, on April 26th at Stanford, Metro North held its first Connect With Us customer outreach program since the 2021 onset of Omicron. For those unfamiliar with our program, it gives customers a chance to discuss ways to improve train service and the customer experience directly with executive staff. Two, uh, two days later, I was proud to join Long Island Railroad re leadership in transportation, customer communications, community affairs, and other departments to meet and chat with customers at Hicksville at the inaugural Connect With Us event for the Long Island Railroad. In May, Metro North presented a warm weather gift to outdoor enthusiasts with the reopening of Breakneck Ridge Station following safety enhancement work. This weekend only stop along the Hudson Line gives uh, adventurers direct access to some of the most beautiful hiking in the state. And these station improvements are part of the comprehensive Breakneck Connector segment of the planned 7.5 mile Hudson Highlands Fjord Trail Linear Park, which will flank the river and connect the village of Cold Spring with the city of Beacon. Breakneck Bridge Station will again close until the anticipated completion of trans, uh, construction in 2025, but once completed, it, along with our Beacon and Cold Spring stations, will provide direct access to the Fjord Trail. We're very excited about that. In May, uh, the end of May, May 31st, MTA Chairman General Lieber and I joined Go uh, Governor Kathy Hochul as she announced that the new 700,000 square foot Long Island Railroad Terminal nearing completion below Grand Central Terminal shall be known as Grand Central Madison, a nod both to GCT above it as well as the famed Madison Avenue corridor. Only a couple days later, on June 2nd, we released our proposed systems times tables that incorporate the substantial and robust service increases that the future GCM and mainline third track would offer customers once both were online. Never was it more apparent that the constraints that we have always faced as a railroad when it came to major service increases were now falling by the wayside. In August, our brand new train time app was introduced to very positive customer reviews. For the very first time, Metro North and Long Island Railroad customers are now able to plan their trips, track train movement, car capacity, as well as buy tickets all in a single app. The new train time app replaces the former MTA eTix and individual trip planning apps for each railroad. We're really proud of our 4.9 star app store rating, plus the fact that it was developed with entirely in-house resources by people who know our system and our customer needs the very best. In September, we said goodbye to the sea of construction plywood, or at least part of the sea of construction plywood, and unveiled a dramatically more modern and spacious Long Island Railroad concourse at Penn Station. Higher, wider, and brighter is the name of the game as crews widened the concourse to 57 feet, nearly doubling the amount of walking space, and raised the now illuminated ceilings to 18 feet. It's still a work in progress, and you'll start seeing the retail and dining options opening their doors along the corridor in the near future. But the on-time and on-budget reopening of this highly utilized space within Penn Station is a big step forward towards the full-scale trans full transformation of Penn Station into a modern, spacious, world-class, and single-level terminal. 
Turning now to ridership, which has been a great story this year, customer traffic certainly looks much different in the latter portion of 2022 than it did at the beginning of the year. More and more people returned to in-person employment and enjoyment. Pandemic era records were being shattered all over the place, not just for weekday peak travel, but on weekends as well. On September 13th, Metro North broke its pandemic era record set the Wednesday before with 180,200 customers, 68.6% .6 of our pre-COVID average. That record was again surpassed on October 11th, which saw almost 192,900 customers. That's our current record for weekdays. But just this past weekend, uh, we scored our highest weekend travel ever, the highest Saturday at 123,285 riders, and then the highest total for the weekend at more than 201,000 riders, which surpasses our previous high for a weekend, which had been October 22nd and 23rd. Long Island Railroad saw its second highest weekday total of 2022 on Wednesday, September 21st, surpassed only by the current pandemic era record, which was the day before Thanksgiving, uh, of 210,400 riders. Both Saturday and Sunday one-day pandemic era ridership records were set on separate weekends in June, which is unsurprising given the usual warm weather travel and excitement for the new summer season out on Long Island. October was a big month for major projects, headlined on the 3rd of October by the celebration surrounding the completion of the third and final segment of the long-awaited third track between Floral Park and Hicksville. The governor was again on hand to christen the new 9.8-mile span that gives Long Island Railroad more operational flexibility, improving safety, minimizing disruptions, and increasing uh, system-wide service by 41% once the full GCM service goes live. It also creates true two-way and reverse peak service along the main line, which is a true boon to regional economic growth efforts. On October 6th, we announced that both east and westbound trains could now stop at Elmont UBS, the first new Long Island Railroad station in almost 50 years, and what has already become a destination for hockey fans and concert goers. Come implementation of the full GCM schedule, commuters will also call Elmont UBS station home as it will become a regular Hempstead branch stop 650, 650 365 days of the year, thanks to the 15-month Bellrose ladder switch installation project, which culminated with the October 29th and 30th signal cutover and subsequent testing. November saw the completion, we're getting there, we're in November. November saw the completion of work on the Great Napaka Track, yet another GCM readiness project in which the segment of track beneath the new Colonial Road Bridge was extended 1,100 feet to accommodate an additional 12-car train. This much-needed additional trackage helps us meet the robust service strategy we have on tap for the Port Washington branch when G GCM service goes live. Late last month, as we discussed at last month's committee meeting, we rebranded Metro North's Customer Call Ahead Assistance Program as Metro North Care to align it with the existing Long Island Railroad Care Service. This ensures customers with mobility impairments that they have the same resources and assistance available to them, whether they're on the Hudson Line or the Hempstead Branch. As was also the case with the new train time app, finding commonality between the two railroads has never made any more sense than it does right now. And then on December 9th, uh, which is, uh, was just last week, residents of transit-starved areas of the East and South Bronx got an early holiday present as we broke ground on the new Penn Access Project. As we all know, this project involves the construction of four new ADA-compliant Metro North stations on Amtrak's Hellgate Line upon completion that will serve as an extension of the New Haven Line from New Rochelle to Penn Station. This exciting and important project enables us to offer new transit options and must, much faster commutes in both directions for East and South Bronx residents. It's estimated that 500,000 people live within one mile of the four new stations in Hunts Point, Parkchester, Van Nest, Morris Park, and Co-op City. A couple Grand Central Madison milestones in addition to what I've already discussed. On December 9th, CND turned over the new terminal and the new system to us. Their major work complete except for the systems testing I've already alluded to and some punch list items. So Grand Central Madison is now a railroad. Last month, we briefly touched upon some of the readiness activities. Um, I want to thank all of the departments and the support that we've been getting from the CND folks to bring these milestones uh, to fruition. Just this past weekend, we completed our final FRA-mandated pre-revenue tra uh, train simulations. This really was an all-hands-on-deck hand effort. I want to thank everybody who was involved. The FRA has approved our pre-revenue safety validation plan, so once that system testing is done, we're ready to start service. Um, 
the last bit of um, news on this front uh, relates to the combo ticket that we're launching. It was sort of talked about in passing by some of the public speakers. Um, the combo ticket, once we go live with the full service, will make it even easier for Long Islanders to check out the Yankee games in the spring or go hiking in the beautiful Hudson Valley in the fall and for Metro North customers to visit the best of Long Island or catch events at UBS Arena. The new combo ticket will be available on the Train Time app, ticket vending machines, and ticket offices. Essentially, it is a, an instrument that allows customers to buy an off-peak ticket on the first railroad. It's a single-day ticket like the city, uh, like a city ticket. Uh, and then the connecting service on the other railroad is an $8 flat fare. Um, so this is a pilot. It'll go for a couple months. We want to really get people excited about the possibilities for travel on both railroads, and we'll see how it goes before making a permanent decision with respect to whether we would continue it. Finally, now that I'm done with the retrospective, I do want to tell a, a story of bravery involving two of our Long Island Railroad employees who happen to be here today. At around 6.45 a.m. on Wednesday, November 30th, Long Island Railroad Corporate Safety Investiga Investigations Managers Felix Moreau and Jerry Burtzel were driving by exit 49 on the westbound LIE on their way to a morning meeting in Jamaica when traffic slowed a bit and they noticed smoke and an orange glow from behind the big rig to their right. Felix, who is himself a volunteer fireman for the Bohemia Fire Department, knew that he had seen this type of smoke before. And once the big rig no longer obscured their view, it was apparent that they were approaching a very fresh one-car crash. Without a second thought, Jerry and Felix pulled off the highway and flew into action. For reasons unclear at the time, a jeep had veered off the side of the highway, flattening a light pole and landing atop an electrical box before catching fire at the Pine Lawn Road underpass. When they arrived, two other Good Samaritans had just started dragging the stunned driver from his car, and yet another was in the process of dialing 911. Felix immediately grabbed his 20-pound Long Island Railroad-issued fire extinguisher and began knocking down the fire, giving Jerry both the time and visibility to search the burning car for any additional passengers. Felix figures he had the initial fire about 90% doused when his extinguisher ran out of product, enabling the flames to build once again and eventually engulf the car. While with the car search, there were no other passengers, and the fire mom momentarily tamped down, the men quickly made their way over to the bloody driver, a schoolteacher named Mike, who was set down alongside the road some distance away. Mike was dazed and had a broken ankle, and our heroes weren't quite sure where the initial Good Samaritans had gone or whether they were still at the scene. Jerry managed to get Mike's wife's phone number, uh, and whose phone was still in the burning car. He called Mike's wife, broke the news, and made sure she was completely in the know and that EMS knew Mike's pertinent health info upon their arrival. He also made sure that the wife had the contact information and twice confirmed for her that, his hus that the husband was going to Nassau University Medical Center. While all this was going on, Felix stayed by Mike to comfort and reassure him that he was safe. Once the scene was secured by PD, fire, and EMS, and that they were comfortable that they had done all they could do to help Mike and his wife, they left and went back to work. <laughs> Uh, of course, still making their meeting on time because this is the Long Island Railroad. We are so proud of these two selfless and courageous employees who exemplify the very best of our workforce and all the qualities that we want them to possess. This morning they are here, and I invite them to come up and be recognized at this time by the committee for their quick thinking and their bravery. And that concludes the President's report. And just before I break, I do want to wish everybody a very, very happy holiday, happy, healthy new year. Yes, questions. You know, on the uh, combo tickets, so the off-peak is any time of day if you're going to buy. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's available peak and off-peak. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're moving on to our operations report. Uh, presented by Robert Free uh, for the Long Island Railroad and then by Justin Vonischek from Metro North Rail. Good morning. Total on-time performance for the month of November was 94.4% and year-to-date as of November was 95.8%, both above goal of 94%. Five branches operated at or above goal for the month of November 
and 10 branches operated at or above goal for the year to date as of November. Um, slippery rail conditions impacted uh, branch performance, as you can see, by only five branches meeting their goal. Um, for major events which result in 10 or more late trains, there were 12 incidents for the month of November, <clears throat> excuse me, the most significant of which was an Amtrak signal problem in Penn Station during the PM rush hour on November 29th. This event negatively impacted on-time performance by 0.2 percent, excuse me. Um, for fleet performance, uh, our MDBF for the month of October was 212,920 miles, and year-to-date as of October was 218,953 miles, both above goal of 190,000 miles. For service delivery, we completed 99.6% of our trips in November, and year-to-date as of November, we completed 99.7% of our trips. Uh, for the upcoming holiday season, we're going to be operating uh, some extra service on Friday, December 23rd, and Friday, December 30th, we'll be operating our early release program, which provides 13 additional eastbound trains beginning in early afternoon. On Saturday and Sunday, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we'll be operating our normal weekend service, and on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, we'll be operating weekend service as well. However, on New Year's Eve, we'll provide 10 additional westbound trains into Penn Station, and on New Year's Day, beginning just after the ball drop, after midnight, we'll provide 15 additional extra eastbound trains out of Penn Station with the capacity to run more trains if necessary. Uh, and just as a reminder, there will be an alcohol ban on Long Island Railroad trains for New Year's Eve. And finally, uh, last Wednesday, the MTA conducted its all-agency winter storm preparedness drill, which both railroads participated in, uh, simulating various scenarios, testing our responses and oversight. It was an extremely successful drill, showcasing our uh, interagency communication and cooperation as well as outside agency as well. So that uh, concludes my report. I'll take any questions you may have. Any questions? No. Mr. Bonacek? All right, good morning. The operations report begins on page 24. System-wide on-time performance for the month of November was 97%, above goal of 94%. Year-to-date on-time performance through November is also above goal at 97.1%. There were three major incidents that negatively impacted on-time performance during the month of November by 0.5%. Two of those were related to weather, and the third was due to heavy loading for customers attending the Cortica Jug football game between SUNY Cortland and Ithaca at Yankee Stadium on November 12th. Regarding fleet, the mean distance between failures for October was 337,000 miles, and year-to-date performance through October was 228,000 miles, both above goal of 175,000 miles. Metro North will also be operating our special holiday service to accommodate customers during the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Customers can check the train time app or Metro North website for complete schedule details. And additionally, service will be provided for the Pinstripe Bowl at Yankee Stadium on December 29th. That concludes my remarks, unless there's any questions. Any questions? Okay, moving on to safety reports. We have Chris Go to go first for Long Island Rail, and then Shelly Prettyman for uh, Metro North. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, Long Island Railroad safety report, including the performance indicators, can be found on page 18 of your committee books. In the interest of time, I'll move right to the year in summary. The Long Island Railroad continues to take steps to improve our safety performance indicators through our range of existing programs and initiatives. Um, from a customer outreach perspective um, and in collaboration with the MTAPD, we continue to expand our in-person outreach. Today we've uh, reached out to approximately 47,000 members of the public who attended our tracks, Operation Lifesaver, Railroad Safety Awareness events. In addition, we've also made presentations to all ages at different schools in addition to outreach tables at community events throughout the year. From our operational perspective, our roadway worker staff has performed over 1,000 observations at locations along the right-of-way. We continue to work with our operating departments and labor partners to identify and manage hazards. Um, from our fire marshal's office, they've performed over 900 inspections to keep our fire life safety system um, adequate. And in addition, we've trained over 1,400 first responders so far. On the environmental side, we've uh, performed approximately 350 field inspections at various locations in our network. Um, the areas assessed include a ha for hazardous waste, stormwater, petroleum bulk storage, and capital projects. Um, in our safety management system, we continue to enhance that. Uh, this year, we successfully transitioned our system safety program to the FRA. 
um, Federal Railroad Administration regulation. Um, to note, we have had a system safety program plan since 1986, but we transitioned um, th this year to the FRA's uh, 270 uh, requirement, and the implementation process is currently underway. Um, as indicated by President Rinaldi, um, Long Island Railroad is undergoing significant expansion, so our team have, working in collaboration with MTA C&D, uh, worked through many projects, and we continue to evolve our infrastructure. Um, this required increased engagement and collaboration with our agency partners and employees to manage all the activities and deliverables that affect the safety of our, of our operation. Um, that concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. Yes, Commissioner Brigham. Okay. <clears throat> yes, I have uh, two items. Uh, one is, most of you know, I'm also the chairman of the PCAC, so this may be a little self-serving, but uh, we sent a letter to the MTA board uh, last week uh, requesting that the MTA upgrade their public service announcements with the upcoming tridemic uh, to encourage mask use on trains. We're not asking for a mandate. We're not asking for mask cars. We're just asking for a much stronger message to be sent out to ridership um, to, wear, to wear masks. Um, and we want to use the word strongly recommend. Again, not asking for a mandate, but we want to strongly recommend it. Again, it's a tridemic right now. We're, we're still dealing with COVID. We got this RSV, and now it's flu season. So anything that can be done in that regard would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, the homeless problem persists in Penn Station. And we understand with the cold weather, the homeless are going to look for someplace warm to come. Um, but we really need to stay on top of this. I don't know if we still have a contract with BRC. Uh, if we do, someone has to really light a fire under their butts because they don't seem to be doing it. Um, I got off the train uh, 8.30 this morning, and there were four members, four apparently homeless individuals in the center corridor. You know, so that's, that's really unacceptable. So that's something we really have to stay on top of. And that's it. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? If not, Shelley? Okay, good morning. Metro North Safety Report is on page 28 of the committee book, and uh, the safety to, 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 excuse me, statistics for the month can be found there. And uh, likewise, in the interest of time, I'll move right to the year on high whites. So Metro North has also continued to take steps to reduce customer employee injury rates, including specific steps in preparation for winter weather. So as one step, the Office of System Safety reviewed recent trends and included relevant information in the agenda for the fourth quarter safety focus week, which we held December 5th to 11th. Throughout the week, managers held interactive discussions with employees, which included seasonally focused reminders on motor vehicle safety, avoiding slips, trips, and falls, and safely mounting and dismounting equipment. Taking a broader look back at the past year, we've continued to pursue a range of programs and initiatives to improve safety trends as well as to maintain system-wide fire life safety. So I'll just touch on a few key, light, key highlights here. So Metro North also continued to expand in-person customer safety outreach across our territory, including presentations for all ages at schools, libraries, daycare centers, and the like, and outreach tables at community events. And we conducted station outreach to customers to increase awareness of safe behaviors as well as uh, outreach at grade crossings. So we had five grade crossing outreach events reaching 345 people and 58 station events reaching 13,828 customers. To support suicide prevention, Metro North has continued to deliver question persuade refer suicide prevention awareness training to employees. With the support of MTA Communications, digital and printed posters on display throughout the territory have been updated to add the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline number, and we are now discussing translating those posters into Spanish. One key initiative led by field safety operations and investigations is the Roadway Worker Audit Group. The group includes managers from the operating departments as well as rules, operations, training, and of course safety. They spend an entire shift conducting audits on and about the tracks to ensure field employees are complying with roadway worker protection rules and MNR safety rules. And the audits also give field employees an opportunity to ask the group questions and get detailed feedback. So the group was launched in mid-2021, and this year has conducted 27 of those audits system-wide to date. And operational incidents involving roadway workers in both maintenance away and transportation have decreased from 21 last year to 12 this year, a 42% decrease. 
and the field safety staff has also completed over 1,200 system-wide safety audits and inspections at shops, yards, stations, and locations along the right-of-way. Findings are shared with the department and safety plans established from those findings as well. A Grand Central Terminal yard cleanup was held on Saturday, December 10th, following an earlier event in June, and these cleanups are also a collaboration among the operating departments and safety. And for the year, overall, 144 bags of common debris or trash were collected, that's lighter items, and over 2.5 tons of construction debris, such as metal, concrete, plywood, and stone. For emergency management throughout 2022, um, MNR Emergency Management delivered 98 public safety classes system-wide with 1,900 first responders uh, attending. These classes provide emergency response, safety, and railroad familiarization training for police, fire, and EMS departments. And I want to note that the Grand Central Fire Brigade monitors li fire life safety systems and responds to fire and EMS alerts throughout the terminal 24-7. In 2022, they continued their excellent work responding to 1,042 fire and EMS callouts with an average response time of two minutes and 15 seconds for the year to date. And that's in addition to their ongoing work to conduct inspections and ensure code compliance in the terminal. For environmental compliance, um, we completed over 300 field audit inspections at various Metro North properties, including yards, repair shops, and substations. And another notable step, um, as my colleague uh, Chris Goh mentioned, FRA also approved Metro North Systems Safety Program Plan submitted in response to the new regulation, and we've begun the implementation process. And of course, Metro North and Long Island Railroad are collaborating closely on that effort. Those are just a few of the highlights, of course, but I want to take the opportunity to thank my staff and all of our colleagues in operations for their uh, partnership and their efforts throughout the year. That concludes my report. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Yes, Commissioner Brown. Yeah, uh, could you go over the statistics again for the fire brigade? Um, how many times they were called out in the last year? Would sure. You say that again. So um, for the year to date, they've responded to 1,042 fire and EMS callouts with an average response time of two minutes and 15 seconds for the year to date. So that's like two and a half times a day they get called out? It's quite frequent, yes. And what's the bulk of those um, incidents? Well, the bulk are, are um, I would say, EMS um, responses, and uh, for that's for customers. Sick well. passenger, this and that. Right? Sure, and, and folks moving through the terminal. I'd be happy to get you more details on that if you'd like more information. I, I had a terrible vision of like three fires a day breaking out in there. So. <laughs> no, no, the vast majority are um, EMS callouts for um, customers and, and others in the terminal, visitors to the terminal who may not be feeling well and to ensure that they get the help that they need. Thank you. Very nice report. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Shelly, I want to thank you and your staff for the suicide prevention training that you offered and that I was fortunate to participate along with other uh, several commissioners last Monday. It was very informative, and we learned a lot about what Metro North is doing. Well, thank you very much. It was our pleasure. And actually, that's another effort that we're partnering with Long Island Railroad on as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, now to give the MTA police report, Chief Mueller. Good morning, everyone. Uh, your uh, MTA PD activity can be found in the uh, safety and security book on pages 19 and 29 respectively. Uh, of note, uh, of the 28 felonies that occurred in our entire system for the month of November, uh, fully 64% of those were uh, grand larceny uh, and half of those, nine, uh, were the result of unattended property. So we're still asking for vigilance um, throughout the system when you're looking at your, you know, looking after your property. I want to share with the uh, committee um, a great collaborative effort that we had uh, in the month of November with uh, SEPTED training, which is crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, the MTAPD hosted this uh, course, and I think what's special and unique about it is, is that we included and, and asked uh, to have our Metro North and our Long Island Railroad partners, I believe eight Metro North uh, partners attended, and oh, I'm sorry, eight Long Island Railroad partners attended, and four uh, Metro North partners attended. And the purpose of this training, it's a five-day, 40-hour course, is to look at space and identify different things that could be done through design to make it safer and more secure. 
So, for example, you know, an easy one to be to, to explain how this is done is to improve lighting, uh, cut back shrubbery so sight lines are improved. At the end of the five days, uh, nine teams went out of the 47 graduates of the SEPTED training, uh, and they were mixed and matched. So we had representatives from the MTA PD, Long Island Railroad, and the Metro North Railroad working, in, you know, as part of teams. They went out, they looked at Tarrytown uh, Station, they looked at Ronkonkoma, Grand Central, Penn, I believe, and uh, they did some really fantastic work in respect to recommendations to make the uh, make our stations and our spaces much safer. So we, we intend to leverage this uh, new knowledge with, uh, as we go forward when we're identifying crime patterns and quality of life issues throughout the system uh, by deploying these teams and sending them out so that they can do assessments on the different properties that are, that are uh, somewhat problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Mack. Uh, Chief, uh, I gotta compliment you again uh, <clears throat> for your initiatives to work with the partners on Long Island, uh, I imagine you're doing the same uh, upstate as well, but uh, I compliment you. We are still the first responders, <clears throat> Nassau and Suffolk, and I compliment you again for your uh, <clears throat> vision to work with our teams in Long Island. Good job. Merry Thanks, Christmas. Sir. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Swarm. Just one quick one. Congratulations. I love the fact that you're looking forward to see the issues that arise. But once the recommendations are made, what's the turnaround time to address them? So that depends on what the recommendations are. So there, there are some that are easier and some are more difficult, the sliding scale. So it's easy to change lights and cut shrubbery. We can do that relatively quickly. Embedding, the fact that we embedded Long Island Railroad and Metro North personnel has made it that much easier. In fact, one of the, the nice benefits and values we've seen from doing this collaborative training is that they're talking to each other and now they're interacting. So depending on what it is, uh, you know, but we move as quickly as we, as we can. So, for example, I know that uh, Hicksville has a, a bike theft issue. Not a huge bike theft issue, but when, when the folks looked at that station, it appeared that the bike rack was in the wrong spot. So what we'll do is we'll move the bike rack where it's under camera, it's more visible and more of a deterrent, and then we'd like to circle back a year from now, same time, you want to compare apples to apples, and then take a look and see if, if, if that adjustment um, drove our, uh, our metrics in the right direction. Thank you so much. Continue the great work. Thank you, and for the remaining information items for Long Island Rail and Metro North, I will hand it over to President Rinaldi. Um, so there are five Long Island Railroad information items which are in your committee materials, the 2023 final proposed budget, the 2023 proposed committee work plan, the diversity and EEO report for the third quarter of 2022, a memo on year-end holiday service, and the review of the committee charter. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on any of those information items, but they're in the book for your consideration. Okay. There are two Metro North action items that do require a vote today. The first is authorization to accept the NISE, uh, NISDOT CMAC grant for connecting services. And the other is approval of the ferry landing parking agreement with the city of Newburgh in connection with the Newburgh Beacon Ferry Service. So I guess we need a motion and a vote on both of those. We have a motion? Yes. Um, Harry and Randy, yes, in a sec. Oh. He did the second. Any questions or comments? If not, may I take a vote? All in favor? Everyone's in agreement. Motion passes. Okay. There are four Metro North information items, the 2023 final proposed budget, the 2023 proposed committee work plan, the diversity and EEO report for the third quarter 2022, and the review of the committee charter. Uh, we can answer any questions any might have, anybody might have about any of those four information items. Okay. The um, finance reports for both agencies are in the book, and there is one procurement, um, which Anthony Gardner here is to it, it can explain. It's on behalf of both railroads, both Metro North and Long Island. Yes, good morning. Uh, there is one uh, procurement item 
approval is requested to implement a one-year contract extension to the competitively led joint Metro North Long Island Railroad contract with Sperry Rail in a not to exceed amount of $7 million, which is split $4 million M&R and $3 million Long Island Railroad. During the contract extension period, Sperry will continue to provide Federal Railroad Administration mandated ultrasonic rail testing and joint bar detection services for both railroads. For services beyond 2023, Long Island Railroad on behalf of itself and Metro North will conduct a new joint competitive procurement which will include an industry review of available technologies and service providers prior to selection and award recommendation back to the board. Funding for services during the one-year contract extension is available in each railroad's operating budget. Um, as a note of Metro North's $4 million total, the Connecticut Department of Transportation is responsible for approximately 33% or $1.3 million of the spend. Are there any questions? First, may I have a motion for it, and then we can do the questions. Motion and a second by, yes, and now we can do any questions or comments. <coughs> okay, now that procurement, that's not all inclusive, right? Don't we, don't the railroads have to provide the operators to operate their? Uh... Sperry, Sperry provides the operators, the railroad um, force, forces do the repairs that are detected by the Sperry ultrasonic testing. Is this a change from previous procedures? No. That's the current program. This is an extension of the current program. Uh, I'll ask the question in private later. Any other questions? If not, can we take a vote? All in uh, favor for accepting these two procurements? Great. Thank you. Motion passes. That concludes the agenda. I just want to express my thanks to the committee for all your support this this year. It's been quite a year, uh, and and the, the the support from both of the railroads. And uh, you know, we we really appreciate everything that you do for us. And I uh, wish everybody a very very happy happy holiday and a happy new year. Thank you very much. Um, and now I may take a motion and a second to adjourn our meeting. Lisa, yes, second. All in favor? Thank you very much. Have a happy holiday, prosperous new year, and we are adjourned.